Mary Goff was a local girl. She just lived down the bottom of the village and I lived up the top of the village. Hi, Colin. Take you, Mary, as my wife. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, all the days of her life. I knew she wanted to be married. That's what she always wanted. So I was happy that Mary was happy. Colin, the word is rang as a sign of our love and fidelity in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The wedding was lovely. Mary looked lovely. It was great to see the two families together. I thank Marie for a wonderful daughter, Mary, now my wife. The week leading up to what happened to her, she ring me every evening. She must have been trying to tell me something. I just kept shaking my head, no, no, it can't be my Mary. It's a cross I'm carrying for life. It had been a quiet evening and the call was for a medical emergency at Clannard Street, Balbriggan. The details on the printout stated that a female had fallen down the stairs and that CPR was in progress. When we were dispatched, we were putting it down as a total accident. People wouldn't realise the number of people who actually fall down stairways. When we arrived at the house, the front door was ajar and there was lights on downstairs. I walked in and the layout of this house was very confined. I seen Colin Whelan standing over a young female. He was in a daze. When I went into the hallway, the station officer advised me to take the husband into a separate room, which I did, to make room for the guys who were going to give the lady CPR. Mary was unresponsive on the floor, so I crouched down and checked for a pulse. There was no sign of any pulse. She was in cardiac arrest. But I could see no visible sign of any injury on her body. The husband asked me the question, is she alive or is she dead? And I said, she's in good hands. On route to the hospital, the crew continued performing CPR and the oxygen was also used in the resuscitation efforts. And that was maintained the whole way to the Bowman Hospital and the resource room. I went to bed half ten. Next thing the phone rang and it was 
one of my sons to tell me that Mary had fallen down the stairs and was going into the hospital. I do remember when the phone went, the first thing that came into my head was Mary. I don't know why or how, but she was my first thought. I got out of bed, got dressed and all. My son collected me. We just knew that we're not going up here for a broken arm or a broken leg. I remember going into the hospital and the head nurse met me and said, I'm sorry, she said, Mrs. Goff, but your daughter has died. Albriggan is in North Dublin. It's a commuter town for Dublin city itself. It's close to the city and it's quite cosmopolitan, yet it had tentacles into the countryside. It's fairly religious. A lot of people would go to Mass, you know, and still hold dear to the Catholic faith. A lot of people would have known each other and a lot of people knew Colin Whelan and Mary. Well, I had four boys, the eldest chap, Gerard, then twins, Seamus and David, then Peter, and then Mary. Yeah, which was brilliant. Little girl. Mary was very quiet, and she was very friendly and laid back, took everything in her stride. On her very first day in school, Mary took my hand. I didn't want to go into school. And then she put her hand out and took my hand, and off we went down to school. And that was the very first day, and it continued from then on. I liked everything about her, everything. She was always bopping about dancing, and to me, when she grew up. She was like a daughter, a sister, and a mother. She was just brilliant. She was happy when she had family around. She was the, the glue that kept us sane and kept us together. Colin Whelan in the early 90s over in Gormanstown in the Huntsman pub. I knew by the way she was talking about him that she really liked him. He wasn't a person that she normally would go for. He was very business-like and serious. But from day one, she seemed to be mad about him. We knew him from a distance growing up because the family households are only about two kilometres apart. But we didn't really know him that well until he started dating Mary. He seemed to treat Mary well, and we just treated him like another member of the family, another brother. I was really happy for her because I knew she wanted to be married to Colin Whelan. So I was happy that Mary was happy. The wedding was lovely. Mary looked lovely. It was great to see the two families together. Colin's brother was best man, and my twin brother, David, gave her away as my father died a few years previously. I, Colin, take you, Mary, as my wife. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Colin, the word is strange as a sign of our love and fidelity in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mary looked beautiful on the day, but she was nervous and excited and mixed emotions. She didn't seem happy. That's 
the way I felt about it. Not as happy as I thought she'd look. She said when she got to the church and seen everybody looking at her and realised she was the centre of attention and that was a shock. She liked to be in the background. I'd like to thank Marie for a wonderful daughter, Mary, now my wife. I won't ask her to say anything because of my neck. But she said that she prayed it for kids. So I won't ask her. Mary and Colin seemed very happy for a while. We went out for food all the time. They came to our house, we came to their house, and we would just be the same as we always were. It wasn't any different. When we returned from the incident, I was uneasy. I was having a cup of tea at home and I was very uncomfortable with the whole situation. I had this feeling that everything wasn't right. And the next morning at nine o'clock, I arrived in to work in my brother-in-law's supermarket and there were two members of the Guardi waiting outside. And they said, good morning, Des. You were on that incident last night. I said I was. And they asked me what I thought of it. And I said I didn't like it. My name is Dominic Hayes. In February 2001, I was a detective inspector with the National Bureau of Criminal Investigation. In the case of a sudden death, it's routine that the local guard station is informed, whether well, that's in a dwelling or in a hospital setting. And, you know, in this case, it was no different. <laughs> Colin Whelan was the last person to see Mary, so as part of routine, he would have been asked to come down to a guard station. He wasn't under arrest, just a witness to explain what had happened. Colin said they had come home from work. She had gone for a shower. And then around 12 o'clock, he explained to us that he heard this tud, 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 and went out into the hall and found Mary's body prostrate at the bottom of the stairs. One of the first responders told us that he had seen some scratches on Colin. And Colin said, when he was helping Mary when she'd fallen down the stairs, that she must have grasped out and grabbed him and scraped his chest. From our inquiries, Colin Whelan was an ordinary Dublin man. He had trained to be an IT programmer. He was working with Irish Permanent Building Society. He had a good job there. He owned his own house. Mary worked as a clerical assistant, so it was very difficult to see if there could be any suspicion against Colin because he had no previous, no domestic violence in the home. And Mary had never complained that he wasn't anything but a loving partner and it seemed to me a loving, permanent relationship. I remember this well because that morning I checked my phone and there was 40 missed calls on the phone and most of them were from my superintendent. We had an incident last night, he says, where a lady was found dead at the bottom of her stairs. The husband had scratch marks on his chest he alleges she fell down the stairs, said it's quite possibly a tragic accident, but he says, I need you to go to the post-mortem. And that's what I did, and sat there, and sat there, what you do when a post-mortem is done, because it takes hours. Eventually, the pathologist came out to me, and she said, her injuries are not consistent with a fall down the stairs. Now, I got a shock. This is not what I was intending to hear. And she said, this lady has been strangled by way of a ligature. I said, how sure are you that this girl was strangled? She said, I'm 110% sure. And she said, you have a murder on your hands. And 
denn die Detectives kommen und erzählen mir, dass sie was mordet. Schock, you know. I just went into shock. I started shaking from head to toe. Couldn't believe what he was actually saying, and it took a long time to click what actually happened. I didn't believe it could have been a murder at the start. It took me a long time to get my head around that, and everybody was very emotional. When we realized that, we had a full murder investigation launched. And with that brings all the different skills of interviewing suspects, interviewing witnesses, looking at all the exhibit, the forensics, and technical examination of the, the scene uh, and of the body as well. So it brings a whole new realm to a complete full investigation. This is a whole new ball game. So, you know, we had to obviously explore and see where, where we go from here. Alan Whelan said that he was the only one in the house with his wife. And as part of the investigation, we looked at all aspects of his movements that day. Colin Whelan got the regular train service from Bradbrigan Station at 7.45, and that got him into the Dublin city centre at around 20 to 9. his way from there to Stephen's Green, where he worked with Irish Permanent. At 1.08 p.m., he left work and went to Brown Thomas, a very exclusive store in the centre of Dublin in Grafton Street. My name is Richard Cullhan. I was a special branch detective, and I served in the North Dublin area. He purchased an ornament, which he explained to the shop assistant that it was a present for his wife. We know he paid almost 100 pounds for that. He left work and arrived back in Balbrig in his hometown at somewhere around 6 p.m. He went to the gym at 6.25 p.m. And he finished at around 7.25 p.m., arriving home very shortly after that. His story checked out. The timeline was corroborated, and we were satisfied that it was a normal day in Colin Whelan's life. There was nothing that we felt that was suspicious about any of his movements on that day. The situation we found ourselves in is that the pathologist was saying that she was strangled, and that's how she died. Her husband saying she fell down the stairs, and he wasn't a person fitting into the profile of a murderer. So, this was a mystery. It was hard for me to understand that here was a person who everyone was telling us he, he was a lovely guy and, and, and a great husband. And then we were looking and Mary had fallen down the stairs, but she hadn't, she had been strangled. So it was difficult to try and match the two different profiles of, you know, a woman who had been killed and maybe her husband was involved, but there was nothing red flagging that Colin was a murderer. We were looking for a motive. Was there somebody else involved? Was there an extramarital affair? They didn't have financial problems, as far as we we're concerned. We couldn't understand why Mary had been killed. So we felt it really important to get the clearest picture as we could possibly get of Colin. And we obtained a warrant from the local district court to search his workplace and his computer. A number of officers went to the workplace and they seized a computer, some floppy disks, some notes, some ledgers, any kind of evidence to give us a clue as to why Mary Whelan had been murdered. All computers that Colin Whelan had access to, both his home computer, and his workstation were taken back to the Garda computer section and they were examined there. My full name is Francisco Gallagher and I was uh, a sergeant in charge. 
or guard computer section, image the hard drive. That means they take a complete and accurate copy of the drive and they work on that and examine it. But they found that there was nothing of significant content at that stage. It would seem that the search history, that the day-to-day -day history of the computer was cleaned. Somebody had gone to some length to remove data that he wouldn't have wanted anyone to know. The Whelan and Goff family were very well known in the area. It's a very small, very closely knit community. So there was incredible sorrow and there was incredulity really among the people of the parish. It was a big story because the person involved was only 27 years old. She was only six months married and she radiated the sense of innocence. And I suppose when people get married, everybody has such hope and expectation and new starts. And everybody could relate to the, you know, a young lady starting out on the next exciting chapter of her life. And where did it all go wrong? And what happened? Everybody was intrigued and shocked in equal measure. After Mary came back from her honeymoon, I noticed a change in her. Mary was quieter and she kind of wasn't as dressed up as she used to. And Colin didn't seem to be the same. I noticed I wasn't invited in anymore and I sensed a coolness. There was an atmosphere. There was something wrong. You could feel it in the house with them. I thought maybe was he with someone else behind our back. In the week leading up to what happened to her, she ring me every evening. And when I think of it now, she must have been trying to tell me something and still wouldn't say it. As our investigation into Mary Goff's murder continued, the finger of suspicion at that time was beginning to point at Colin Whelan and nobody else. He had said, that it was only himself and his wife in the house at the time. And we had discovered that he had made the effort to cover up his tracks and he'd wiped the searches from his hard drive and computer so we couldn't establish a motive. But we knew that she was strangled by way of a ligature and we didn't know what the murder weapon was. And any murder investigation, it's always relevant to establish a murder weapon, because the murder weapon can lead you to the suspect. We deployed a full forensic and technical team to Mary's home at Clannard Street. That means ballistics were bringing fingerprints, a chemist, a photographer, and they minutely go through each and every piece in the house. They found a duvet at the bottom of the stairs. There was a blood-stained towel. They found blood in a number of locations up the stairs, and there was a number of pieces of clothing which were blood-stained. It was very evident that some violent struggle had taken place on the top of the stairs that Colin hadn't told us about. There was only two in the house, so there's no doubt Colin was telling us lies. There was a number of scenarios in my head of how Mary could have died. It could have been a crime of passion, just that they had a domestic row and the struggle ensued and Mary fell down the stairs. Or it could have been planned, so Colin choked and murdered Mary and then pushed her down the stairs. 
But at that stage, we didn't know. I did not think Colin could have done this at all. I said, no, no, it can't be right. I never seen Colin as a violent man. I think he was very nice to Mary. He was kind. He bought her presents all the time. And he seemed to be the perfect husband. I couldn't believe it. I went over to his house and I sat with him. And I was holding his hand on the bed. He was not emotional at that stage. He was just sitting there, very serious. He had a blank expression on his face. And he turned around and he said to me, the guards have just left and they think I have something to do with this. And at that stage, I start putting two and two together. The house was after being cordoned off and the guards were here and there might be more to this. <laughs> I decided I think I better leave this room. I went down towards the bottom of the bed and his, some of his family were there and I felt they were trying to get me out of the room, to be honest. So I left at that stage thinking there's something not right. Colin Whelan's workstations had been examined by the Garda computer section and they found that they would need to look further for any additional evidence because there was nothing significant on those computers. But as it transpired, Irish Permanent retained a copy of logs. Basically, any institution backs up their day-to-day -day work. So to that end, they had a server that would record any and all use of the internet services that was available in that building. And that was retained at a level that probably Mr. Whelan didn't know. And that data basically captured every keystroke of the terminal in use by Colin Whelan. And with the help of Irish Permanent, we were given access to that data. And then, and only then, did the investigation really launch forward. When I started examining the logs, there was so much data to go through. I was trawling through them for days on end. And then, all of a sudden, unbelievable that I was looking at this. I came across other search terms like blocking the windpipe and strangulation, choking. This wasn't something that was just out of curiosity. This was ultimately going to bring about the death of another person. I was shocked when I saw in the month of August virtually a month before he married her, was strangulation. Then, as I trawled back to the month of June, he was looking up the spelling of asphyxiate, two months before they even married. I was surprised this lady even made it home from our honeymoon. Just to use somebody of that, just to further their own ends, you know, to further a better life, so that he would arrange another rendezvous with, with other people on the internet and, and be setting up a future life. All this was, was open to me. I could see all of this. It was, it was like looking at a bad movie, you know? It really was, because this is what the picture, those logs showed me of the callousness and of the, the total disregard this man had for this, this woman. When we realised the different sites that Colin had been accessing, with a view to murdering Mary, then we realised it was no crime of passion. This was a cold, callous killer who had researched in detail how he was going to murder his wife. 
and when he was going to do it. This was completely shocking for us. So that changed my view of him completely. Mary, wear this ring as a sign of our love and fidelity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Colin marries Mary in September and has killed her within five months. It really was incredible. This man had it in his mind prior to walking up the aisle with his wife to dispose of Mary. I just feel numb when I think about it. I can't really think that somebody that I thought I knew so well could plan something like that. The murder certainly did cause tension in the community because, first of all, people could not understand why Mary was killed. There was absolute shock and horror, the fact that uh, a young woman who had been married for a very, very short space of time, six months, uh, was now dead and somebody had murdered her. It was just the sense of silence. People just couldn't comprehend what had been visited upon them and a girl that they knew all their lives. I don't think they could even find the words to describe how they were feeling, they were that shocked. People could not understand why Mary was killed. They surmised that maybe Mary did something, you know, that, that brought it about, you know, which was totally untrue and unfounded. There were a, a minority of people who believed in Colin Whelan's innocence without knowing all of the facts. And then there were those who were in Mary Whelan's camp because she was, and her family were so well respected and she was so liked in the community. Her friends, her relations, her families, and her neighbors, they all believed that this was awful that Mary Whelan, an innocent woman, had been murdered. Mary was killed, and the people who knew Colin, his friends believed that he was innocent, and he couldn't bring himself to do such a thing. Some people were very angry toward the police. They felt that we were setting up Colin Whelan, an innocent man. <laughs> And why were we pursuing this case so vigorously and putting out all these rumors about Colin Whelan and how he strangled his wife? They just did not want to believe that Colin Whelan could have murdered his wife. We knew that Colin Whelan was a conniving person and had gone about the premeditated murder of his wife. We did not know what item was used to strangle Mary and what manner she was strangled. There wasn't a ligature mark other than a small burn mark on her neck. And we were trying to figure out how come there was no ligature mark right around. We just didn't know and we had to figure that out. One of the items that he searched on Google was a murder in America, who was Henry Wallace. He was a serial killer who had murdered nine women. His modus operandi of killing these women was strangling them, but not leaving a ligature mark. And in one of the particular cases, he used a towel to disguise the ligature mark. And this was really a light bulb moment for me. The yellow towel at the end of the stairs took on a whole new meaning. And this article having been read, there was a correlation between the two. It was good evidence that with what was subsequently found at the scene, and I knew that this would help the investigation team going forward. We believed it was used as part of the murder disguising the ligature mark by using the towel first. He had used the belt from his dressing gown and wrapped the towel round it and strangled his wife. We could establish Mary's blood on the dressing gown cord and you could physically see where it was stretched. And we had no doubt that this was part of the murder weapon with the yellow towel.
he was quite satisfied that he was going to fool the police, he was going to fool the medical people and fool his family. It was the worst thing that ever could happen to us, and what he'd done. He must never have taught anything of Mary or our family. He must have never loved her whatsoever. And he had no thought for anyone only himself. We knew how Callan Whelan had murdered his wife. What we still didn't know at that stage, why did he murder his wife? When they were doing the forensic examination of his computer at work, it was discovered that he had entered a chat room and he was engaging with women online. He had set up and become a webmaster of extramaritalaffairs.com. It was a, a website for, for obvious reasons that people would partake in. He was portraying himself to be single and wanting a relationship. There was some traffic along that, but what became repetitive and noticeable was this particular link with a lady in Wales. We discovered that he had met a girl who was living in Wales, in the Rhonda Valley, and I said, we have to speak with this lady. I travelled to Wales and we went to her house. And she says, oh yeah, I know Colin very well. Come in, come in. And I went into the kitchen, which was sort of open plan, and stuck on the fridge door with a big magnet was a big picture of Colin Whelan. So I took the picture and I said, exhibit one, I says, do you know this guy? Yeah, she says, that's Colin Whelan. And she was getting a little concerned, like, what's all this about? And I said, his wife has died. No, sure, I know that. His wife was killed in a car crash. That's what he told me. And I says, no, his wife died on the 1st of March. She died by strangulation, and we believe Colin murdered her. And she just collapsed on the floor. She was genuinely in love with him, and she was absolutely brokenhearted. And I told her, as we can tell from his internet communication with you, you were sending greeting cards to each other and you can see that your relationship was building up to such a stage that you were going to visit him on the weekend his wife was killed. Yes, she says, and I kept every one of those greeting cards. And she went up and got them down. There was something like 120 greeting cards from the day that she first communicated with him right up until the day or so before the murder. She just wanted to tell the truth and get it off her chest and get it out there. I felt so sorry for her. She was a lady who had been married a number of times and relationships didn't work. She felt now that Colin was the one. She told me she was in love with him, like it was a cyber affair. And I was quite intrigued by it all, like how you can fall in love with someone through the screen and not actually meeting the person. But he was engaging in a relationship, telling lie after lie after lie and leading this lady on. He bombarded her with emails. They got more personal and he started to tell her he wanted to go over and live with her. He said he wanted to buy a property in Wales and that he was coming into a, a large fortune. He even told her that his father had discovered lumps on his pancreas, that he believed his pancreatic cancer. And this is a lady he knew had lost her mother through cancer. On the day he murdered Mary, he had phoned her. And then he said he'd come over and visit her. And we can see from his internet access that he was looking at hotels and stuff in Wales. She told me a story. And it was absolutely terrifying because she was almost his new lover. She feared she could have been next. 
but he had no intention of meeting her. He didn't have those feelings for her. And he certainly didn't want her arriving on his doorstep. He totally manipulated her, sucked her in and used her for no good reason other than he could do it. And at the back of it all, he doesn't give two shits about her. So the question remained, what was the motive for the murder of his wife? And in one of the files we took from his house, we believed we may have had the answer. We knew Colin Whelan murdered his wife on the 28th of February, 1st of March, 2001. But in this case, it was very difficult because we didn't have a clear motive for Mary's murder. That was the big question that at that stage we couldn't answer. So we looked through documents that were seized from Mary's house and we discovered an insurance policy that Colin had taken out on the 15th of March 2000 to the value of £200,000. And we could see from the follow-on documentation in that file that in May of the same year, he upped the insurance policy sum to £400,000. It was just the discovery of the life insurance policy it was that central piece of the jigsaw that answered all our questions. He had taken it out on Mary and himself that if either one of them died, they would be paid £400,000. And at the end of 10 years, if none of them have died, that's the end of the policy, and they get no cash in value. So there was no sense to it. Our experts that looked at this policy said it was ridiculous. It was a huge amount of money for a couple who were just in their late 20s. They were in perfect health. They had no children. And the amount of money was way over the top. So it was evident to us that he was going to cash in on this money before the 10 years was up. And that's what he tried to do. That was the motive for us. That was it. That was the golden nugget that told us this is the reason why he killed his wife. At that stage, I had been a detective for nearly 20 years, and it was difficult to understand how somebody can be so callous and so calculated, marrying a lady with the intention of killing her to claim the insurance. That was a shocking revelation for us. On the 10th of April 2001, we had enough circumstantial evidence to show and believe that Colin Whelan was responsible for the murder of his wife. We had a motive and we had all the elements that showed how he committed the murder. So I went to Gormanstown where Colin was living with his parents at the time. The door was opened by his father and we said, we're going to speak to Colin. He says, come in. I went down to the bedroom. He was lying awake in bed. And I said, you'll be coming with us, like, you know. And I says, I'm detective, sir. Oh, I know well who you are, he said. I know well who you are. He got dressed, came up to the sitting room, and there I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murder of your wife, Mary Goff. And he said, fine. That was in front of his parents. They didn't react in any way, or they didn't kick up a fuss, and I took him, put him in the patrol car with two other detectives and brought him to Balbrigg and Garda Station. We initially walked him through to the custody suite where we brought him to an interview room. Colin told us 
in his statement initially that there was nobody in the house, there was no break-in, and Mary fell down the stairs and died. And he confirmed to us, having read over the statement, that it was correct. So that was a really important piece of evidence. Evidence is the currency, and he was sticking with his statement, which suited us and suited the prosecution case, because there's no doubt Colin was telling us lies. He accepted that all the computer evidence that we had were from his computer. A lot of the questions put to him in relation to the forensics evidence, he went no comment. And for a long part of the interview, he didn't comment. When it was put to him about killing Mary, having an affair online, he got emotional and there were tears in his eyes. But he, he didn't fully break down and composed himself and continued to answer no comment. It eventually came to the time to charge him with the murder of his wife. And that was a great moment because he really believed in his head that maybe he could beat this. And we took him to court the following morning. I remember speaking to him when we transported him. He sat in the back of the car with another detective. I was in the front and we had a driver. And I remember asking him the question, why did you have to murder your wife? You could have walked away. And he put his head down. He was cuffed, but he put his hands to his face. And he remained that way until we got to the court. It was a huge media frenzy. 29-year-old Colin Whelan was brought before Swords District okay. Court today, charged with murdering his wife at their home between the 28th of February and the 1st of March last. In reply to the charge, he said, I did not do it. He was remanded by the judge. We took him to prison. And I said, you've got to come clean. You know, don't put our family through this. And again, he, he looked out the window and he was a little bit teary-eyed, but he said nothing. He remained quiet. Normally in murder cases, people are given bail because there is a lag of maybe two years for a trial date. So if they're not a flight risk, if they won't impede the prosecution, the judge may grant bail. So in this case, Colin Whelan was granted bail with certain conditions. We wanted him to sign on daily at Balbrigg and Garda Station. We wanted him to reside in Gormanstown with his parents. And we wanted an independent, substantial cash security, which was provided. And he secured his bail, and from the 11th, he was out. I wanted the truth and to find out what happened to Mary. Once you know the truth, you can deal with it. It's what you don't know you can't deal with. I never wanted to talk to him. I never wanted to attack him. I just let the uh, justice take its course, you know. It really just brought everybody down. Everybody was so upset. Just wanted to get him to face what he did. And then he was out on bail. It was awful. Because you're kind of in limbo. And my grandfather was right. The devil looks after his own. Whelan had been adhering to his bail conditions and been signing on at Balbriggan Garda Station every day for two years. One day I got a phone call to say that his family are reporting him missing. I immediately uh, checked the sign-on register and discovered he hadn't signed on for two days. And they were now reporting him as a missing person. I didn't know where he was. I hadn't a clue where he was. And where could we find him? 
Colin Breland's car was missing. It was circulated through the various stations, you know, that we were looking for this particular car. We got a phone call from Mary's brother to say that Colin had disappeared and nobody knew where he was. And then we heard the news that the car was found. It was discovered in Holth Head. When we arrived, the car was parked very neatly in a parking space. My mum and dad did bring me up to where he had parked the car, and we had a look around. The window was slightly down on the passenger side, enough to get your hand in. The keys were on the passenger seat. There was an empty bottle of gin. When I heard about Colin disappearing, we didn't know what to, what to say or what to do. You know, it's just a, a limbo situation to be in. This area has been known for people to commit suicide. It's quite high up and it falls into the sea, a little bit like Beachy Head. Well, it upset all my family. Naturally enough, and they were worried about me. He's now a missing person, so I had to engage the Coast Guard services to do a land and sea search. We searched the area to see if there was any sign that somebody had committed suicide on the actual cliff. No, that didn't happen. We didn't discover anything in that regard. It was a huge search after he disappeared, and I mean, huge, uh, nothing was found, and uh, there was no trace of him. Obviously, we wanted to know where Colin Whelan was, so we tried ringing his number, and there was no response. I checked the phone records, and the last phone call that was made on that phone was to the Samaritans. The call didn't last that very long, but he was giving us the impression that he was in a state of mind of self-harm. The phone call to the Samaritans lasted a second. When I arrived in Hoth Head and I saw the car, and I knew he's no more after chucking himself into the sea than the man in the moon. The car was perfectly parked. If you knew Colin Whelan, he was a precision engineer about everything he did. The car window was halfway down, so he knew someone could reach in, take the keys and unlock it, and the car wouldn't be damaged. When I found out that Colin's car had been found in Hill of Hoth, having spoken to him and having dealt with him at length in the interview process and during the investigation, uh, I felt, you know, he's a cold, callous, calculating guy. I felt that this probably wasn't a missing person. I think there was a collective from the family that we didn't believe that he had taken his own life. I did think Colin was capable of anything. I thought maybe he had gone off to start a new life. The Whelan family believed that Colin committed suicide. The Goff family didn't. He was six months out from the court date. He was up for murder. So I think he took the easy way out. And many people believed that Colin Whelan was living up somewhere in the sun. We had no idea where Colin Whelan was. We could only surmise that, you know, he had left the country, and we weren't even sure of that. We initiated a media campaign to alert people of the fact that we were now looking for Colin Whelan, and it was in the papers every day for perhaps a week, and in some form or other. We contacted Interpol and Europol. Interpol, of course, are an international organization. Europol deals specifically with Europe. We share information, establish people who are sought for interview or sought for, for crimes that have been committed. Having contacted them, we were looking worldwide for Colin Whelan. It would mean that ferry terminals, airports, all, all ports, entries and exits from all the countries would now know that Colin Whelan was on the run and he was sought by Irish police.
When I spoke to the victim's mother, Mary, she just couldn't understand that if he didn't love her, why didn't he just walk? And if he had, she'd be alive and he wouldn't be on the run. When I heard about Colin disappear, I thought then, well, justice will never be done. I think that his friends believed that he was innocent. People who knew him believed he couldn't bring himself to do such a thing. Of course, they weren't aware that he was looking up, you know, how to kill his wife on the internet. When Colin Whelan went on the run, those people that were in his camp suddenly realized, well, why has he gone on the run? Why is Colin Whelan missing? Why, if he is innocent, is he not prepared to stand trial and argue his case? It proved uh, his guilt more so. Uh, the fact that he had gone on the run, so an innocent man would not take that, uh, that road. I was disappointed that justice wasn't going to be served, and I suppose maybe, looking back, maybe we shouldn't have allowed bail, that he should have been put in custody and, and a trial date set. So maybe I was looking internally to myself and said, listen, maybe I made a mistake. We were concerned that if we had lost him, and we weren't going to get him back, that this was going to be a travesty of justice. Port Towns News is full of beautiful houses. Uh, people like Peter Stringfellow used to live there. A lot of people that have got a lot of money live up there. There's a couple of nice hotels up there. People that have got boats in the port tend to stay around the port. If they're not on the boat, they're in a hotel near it. Port of Batals is probably the top um, resort for the wealthy in New York. They come from all over the world with the super yachts, you know. You know, you know the likes of Paris Hilton walking up and down the street. Back in 2004, I was approached by a couple of guys from London who were going to build a nice bar in Mallorca. And we started to design a bar called Karma. It was beautiful, really, really done really well. While we were putting Karma together, we were searching for different staff, different people, male, female. People who had bar backgrounds, people that looked good as well. During that process, we came across an Irish guy who joined us uh, called Martin. Casual, kept himself clean, good hair. Uh, he, was, he was a nice guy. He came across as a nice guy. In 2004, I was working as a reporter and a showbiz journalist um, with the Evening Herald in Dublin. Myself and my friend got a bargain holiday to Mallorca and off we went. Towards the end of our holiday, we went out on a paddle boat and met a group of English people who invited us to a nightclub called Karma. It was really fancy and it was a bit surreal because we were on the cheapest holiday that you could possibly buy and here we were drinking champagne with these uh, English people. My friend Alec said there's an Irish barman here and you know with a couple of drinks I was like oh I must uh, you know chat to him. So when I went up and uh, I saw the barman he was you know tall dark and handsome and he said to me, what can I get you? I said, oh, you're Irish. So I expected that we would strike up a conversation, um, but it was very clear from, as soon as I asked him if he was Irish, um, that it was obvious that conversation was going to go no further than me getting my drinks. He, he was not interested in chit chat. I mean, it was very unusual for me to be met with such a hostile attitude. And that's why I remembered this man.
He just kept himself to himself, didn't really talk too much. We never really asked too much. We didn't have to. We didn't do background checks because um, you wouldn't need to. You're already in Mallorca. I often say there's a lot of people that come to Mallorca that are running away from something. You know, we never ask what they're running away from. It'd be a good spot that's home to, you know, millionaires and billionaires from all over Europe. They wouldn't have gone into the Karma Bar where he worked. I learned that he had quite a good social life. He had a girlfriend, an English girlfriend. He lived locally. He lived in Magaluf, you know. It wasn't a particularly uh, posh part of town. But he had a good life, you know, and he was earning good money. I think he got overconfident that he was living a new life on his new persona, and uh, he wouldn't be recognised. It was if he left the old Colin Whelan behind, the Colin Whelan, the killer, and, and moved on to another life. I didn't really think much about him. I don't know if to think about it without thinking about him. My daughter was gone, and that's all I thought about. And look after my own family, the family, and be there for them, babysit the kids and whatever. That was it, carried on my life. I didn't know how to react. I didn't know, obviously, where he was and didn't know if he was ever going to be brought to justice. I got to the point where he, I just presumed that he wouldn't be caught. There was a lot of me thinking that we'd never get justice. 14 months had gone by, no sight or sign of Colin Whelan. We had our evidence. All we needed was to get him before the courts. Where was he? But one day, I got a phone call. It was a tip-off. This guy saw Colin Whelan behind the bar. Because he knew him, he went to school with him, and he knew he was wanted for murder. And he befriended one of the bar staff, and the bar staff said, oh, yeah, that's Kean Sweeney. He's from Galway. He's an Irish guy. And. When he came back home, he reported that to us. When we learned that a person fitting Colin's description was working at a bar in Spain, there was a sense of delight, but it was important that we confirm, without alerting Colin Whelan, which is important, that we were on his trail and that we had the mechanism in place to arrest him in case he would leave the country. We were, of course, unsure as to whether we would get him back or not, but we were certainly determined that he would uh, be caught through Interpol. We were requesting the Guadalajara Seville to look at this particular premises and tell us if Colin Whelan was there. And we supplied them with a photograph and a set of fingerprints. Each country has an Interpol representative in Europe. They sit down and share information, share actions. So the minute we knew it was him, our representative there had the details, had where he was working, what he looked like. His DNA and his fingerprints were important to confirm identity, and they were all sent out with the European arrest warrant. My name is Marines Maimó. I'm an agent of the Guardia Civil. I've been 36 years in the body. In 2004, eh, genera un informe que se tramite a través de Interpol, entonces nosotros iniciamos el trabajo a través de esa información recibida. Now, in the meantime, as luck would have it, a lady came forward and she said uh, she'd been reading an article in uh, an evening paper and she saw a picture of Colin Whelan wanted for murder. And she said, I came across that guy in Spain behind a bar and I got speaking to him and we got friendly and he gave me his name and his business card and wrote his name on the back of the business card. 
and he gave his name as Kean Sweeney, the same name as the other guy he had. She gave me the card and I looked at the writing, which was quite distinct. Colin Whelan had quite distinct writing. And I compared it against his signature on the statement that he made on the night Mary was murdered. And the writing was extremely similar. Here we have two verifications that the same pub or the same premises, Colin Whelan was working there. The question was, how did he get there? We had his passport. He couldn't leave the country as far as we're concerned. So on what passport was he going? Was it an English passport, an Irish passport? So I was saying, yes, this is coming together. This is coming together. And you're, you're very wary. You're going to keep this now tight and, and do the job properly. There was a sense of delight, but it was important that it be kept secret until we confirmed, first of all, that it was him and that a European arrest warrant was in place. Bueno, en ese momento que se obtiene esa información, se designa un equipo de trabajo y se acude al lugar de, de Portals donde supuestamente podía estar trabajando Colin Willard. It was a Friday night, I was in Karma, and I was approached by a guy. He then produced a badge, and I said, yeah, can I help you? Entonces, los oficiales que estaban trabajando en ese momento se dirigieron al encargado de dicho bar, le mostraron una fotografía de Colin Whelan. That's when he showed me a photo of Martin with a name on it, and I said, yeah, I know him, but I don't know him by that name. Entonces, los agentes de la Guardia Civil le preguntaron si en ese momento estaba en el local y dijo que no, que empezaba a trabajar en momentos posteriores. They came in. I motioned where he would be, and uh, they went behind the bar. Entonces, los agentes de la Guardia Civil, concretamente dos, se dirigieron a él, lo identificaron. Al ver que la fotografía sí se correspondía con la persona, procedieron a su detención. They put him in handcuffs. He looked around and kind of nodded, like, you know, I'll see you. And we thought, oh, okay. So the rest of the staff were like, what's going on? I said, okay, I don't know what's going on but they'd been in earlier on to say they were coming to talk to him. I said, meantime, let's all get back to work. Uh, what we've learned here in Mallorca is when the boys in green come and take someone away, you don't interfere with them. You just don't. And they drove away. A partir de ahí, fue trasladado a las dependencias de Guardia Civil Palmanova. Colin Willan no se resistió en ningún momento. Ahora bien, hizo lo que suele hacer sobre todo la gente que utiliza una identidad falsa, alegar que se trataba de un error, que era imposible, que él no había hecho nada y que no se trataba de la misma persona. I spoke to the staff of the Karma Bar, Des Mitchell, his, his manager at the time, and he was convinced that the mistake had been made, that Martin Sweeney was not a fugitive. He was uh, one of his best workers. I was told that Colin initially said he was Key and Sweeney and that they had the wrong man. He protested his innocence to such an extent that they were nearly convinced that they had got the wrong man. So we were at the stage that we had to prove that he was Colin Whelan. Two plainclothes officers brought him to the local police station. They examined both sets of fingerprints, the prints that we took when he was arrested here, and also the prints that they took on his arrest in Spain. They were satisfied. They were dealing with 
the Colin Whelan that we wanted here. And he put his hands up and he admitted then that he was Colin Whelan. After that, he was taken to Palmer Jail and the extradition uh, proceedings began. I knew at that stage nobody had ever been extradited from Spain back to Ireland. So this was a first for all of us, the team, and we had to make sure that this was done correct. When we found out what had gone on, we were all shocked. We were all... We were all a little bit stunned because, obviously, you know, you're working with this guy. I spoke to other bar staff as well, and they were singing his praises. It sort of indicates that he could step away from the old column wheel and become Martin Sweeney. We didn't know. We just didn't know. We got a call to say he had been found in Spain we weren't given the specifics of it. We didn't know still whether we would sort of get justice. When I verified to Mary's family that yes, he had been arrested in Spain, they were crying down the phone. I was emotionally distressed. Didn't know what to say or do. Was very happy that he was found because he was going to be brought back. I arrived in Madrid, I met with the Guadier Seville and they brought us down to the holding areas underneath the airport. It was just like Silence of the Lambs. There was cells left and right. Some of them were perspexed up, some of them were all with bars and that. And halfway down, I looked into the right and there was Colin Whelan standing there. He looked a sorry full figure. He had grown a beard, he stood, he looked at me, I looked at him, and you can say a lot in a look. And I knew that he knew the game was up, and I knew I had him. When it became clear that he was accepting who he was and he wasn't going to fight to extradition, I suppose there was relief, I think, more than anything, that uh, he was coming back to Ireland and that we would have a trial. When I came back from holiday, I was reading the Evening Herald and the big story was about this barman called Colin Whelan, um, who had murdered his wife. And the photo really got my attention. And I immediately, like Karma Nightclub, jumped out at me. And my blood just ran cold. And I thought, that was the rude man. That was the rude man. And it suddenly clicked on me why he was so rude. I mean, there was no way he was going to be friendly and tell me where he was from. He was a man on the run. It's almost breathtaking, the arrogance of Colin Whelan, that he would stand behind a bar and think that nobody would recognize him. You don't expect uh, to be served by a murderer when you're on holidays. And I asked him straight out about the passport. He told me how he acquired it. He identified someone who lived not too terribly far from him, who was roughly the same age and the same type of build, but knew that this person is a person that wouldn't be flying or wouldn't be traveling the world. So he went about obtaining a passport in that man's name using documentation. Something from a, like a spy novel. Actually, the Irish police think you know, he looked up uh, Frederick Forsyth, the day of the jackal, to, to obtain a passport. And he was successful in obtaining a passport in the name of Martin Keane Sweeney with Colin Whelan's photograph. Seven months prior to him disappearing, he had obtained this passport and had it in his possession. So he knew he was going to disappear at some stage. The real Martin Sweeney was not too happy to find out that his name was being bandied about in a murder case, and um, his family were very angry. Colin Whelan said he went to Belfast, got a ticket, he flew to London, and then he said he got a ticket from London to Barcelona. And he said, while in Barcelona, 
I got a boat to Mallorca. I remember flying back when he was sitting in the back and I was handcuffed to him. I asked him, did he want a drink or anything? He says, I wouldn't mind a Coke. And uh, I read the paper. He had an element of, how do you say, calmness about him, like, you know, but I know what he is and I know what he's capable of and I know what he did. So I remember asking the question, he says, what's going to happen when you go back? I said, what are you going to do? And I didn't say anything to him about pleading guilty or not guilty. I just asked him, what are you going to do? But he knew what I meant. And he said, uh, the barristers work for me. I don't work for the barristers. And that's all that was said. So I remember saying to myself, like, you can't judge that. So we were geared up for a full trial regardless. When I found out what freight he was coming in on, because I work at the airport, I have uh, access to the sort of the, the ramp area where the planes come in. So um, I went to the arrivals gate and one of the detectives was there and he actually came over to me and says, uh, you're not going to hit him, are you? And I'm, no, I'm not, no. So I went through the doors down the airside and as he was coming down the uh, air bridge steps, he looked up and I stared him straight in the eye and he stared at me and then just put his head back down and he looked, he looked uh, sort of uh, a beaten man. That was the end of it, like, you know, there was nothing he could do or say or defend himself from, or to stop himself from the uh, inevitable happening of him going to prison for a long time. Once someone is charged, it doesn't mean that the investigation is over. It's continuing all the time. What we have to do is a due diligence report on him to look back on his history from a young age. And uh, we have to find out everything we can about him. And we did discover disturbing aspects of his previous relationships with girls. One of my detectives came to me one day and said, there's a girl that we should be speaking to because she had a relationship with Colin Whelan and he was very violent to her. I interviewed her and she had been prepared to travel to Dublin to give evidence at his murder trial. She was willing to speak because she did want people to know what kind of a man had committed this awful, awful crime. You know, he was so controlling with her and frightened her so much that she left the jurisdiction. So certainly that changed our, our view of Colin Whelan. She met Colin Whelan at a regular disco. It was 1993, and this young man asked her out to dance, and she was really taken by him. He was very good-looking, he was well-dressed, and then for the next six months, he wooed her relentlessly. She told me that once they were involved uh, in a relationship with one another for six months, things began to change. He became physically violent towards her, but also controlling of her behaviour. He, he would tell her what to wear, he would tell her who they were socialising with, where they were going on the night out, and that if she as much as looked as another man, he let her know in no uncertain terms that that was a problem. Understanding what had happened in his relationship with this lady gave us an insight also into Whelan's capacity to instill fear in women. Some ways into their relationship, she became pregnant. She was so fearful of telling him that she was pregnant, she waited to tell him. And when she did tell him, he just lost the plot. He got really, really angry and said, this can't happen, this cannot happen, my family will never accept it. And he then tried to get her to abort their unborn child. He brought a bottle of vodka and some aspirin to her flat one night and was egging her on to take them. Then he tried to force feed her with the vodka and the aspirin. So she managed not to swallow the aspirin, but she did admit to me that she had taken some vodka. And then, at the pinnacle of his violence, he kneed her in the stomach 
and the next day she had a miscarriage. He was a bully. He had a threatening manner. And was this lady uh, and Mary Goff the only women that had been threatened by him? When she became aware as to how Mary was killed, she told me her blood went cold and it sent a shiver down her spine because during her time with Colin Whelan and when they were in the bedroom, he would put pressure on her neck. And when she read the details of how Mary died, her instinct was, that could have been me. There were a minority of people who believed in Colin Whelan's innocence without knowing all of the facts. They believe Colin was a decent guy. He had been reared properly. He had gone to school. He had gone to college. He got his qualification. He set up his own business. They had no idea, absolutely no idea, the other side of Colin Whelan. Here's a man who could survive on his wits and his manipulative power given the way he pre-planned how he was going to commit murder and get away with it and financially benefit from it. It's shocking. And Garda Siakana did a very good job and they put it all together. We owe the family to secure a prosecution. It was very important that we get justice. It reinforced our determination to take him to trial and convict them of that murder. Last night, Colin Whelan was extradited from Spain. Members of his family were in court for the brief hearing. Colin Whelan was taken from Dublin Airport to the Bridewell Garda station where he was held overnight. Today in court, Judge Patrick Brady remanded him in custody to appear before Mr Justice Paul Carney at the Central Criminal Court on Monday morning. day of the court, it was very scary and emotional. I seen Colin walk in and he gave a look the corner of his eye and I just felt so sick. It brought me back to, to that night. Oh, the family were there for the fact that he had absconded and was now back before the courts. It was of huge interest uh, nationally. Everybody had bated breath. Like you have to imagine that Colin Whelan's family believed he was innocent, and this was a makeup by the guards. They had no idea what we knew. And I felt sorry for them in a way because they just did not have a clue. So I was in such a state. I seen Colin sitting so straight up and a blank look on his face. Colin Whelan was asked, did you kill Mary Goff? And he looked over at me and looked at me as if to say, well, you know what I was talking about now coming home with the plane. And he turned to the judge and says, guilty. I looked up at the gallery and I could see the Whelan family were in shock. I could see their jaws literally dropping. I could see the expression of, like, this couldn't be right. Like, they just could not believe what they had heard. This morning, shortly before a jury was due to be sworn to hear his trial, which was due to last two weeks, Colin Whelan pleaded guilty to the murder of his wife, Mary. It just took everybody's breath away. 
for him to stand there and admit it, it was very emotional. We didn't have to go through the court hearing all the brutal details of what he had planned and what he did. So for the Goff family and for myself, I was happy. It was such a relief. If you don't any right thing for us as a family, that would have been it. Colin Whelan changed his plea to guilty because he knew that there was a body of evidence that was so great and so damning that he was going to be convicted. He also didn't want the public to be made aware of his history. Uh, he didn't want the public to understand exactly who Colin Whelan was. Colin Whelan stood before the court and his counsel read out a letter of apology to the Goff family. He was now sorry that what he did and how he did it, and that he didn't tell the truth, but you know, no doubt it was self-serving. He didn't feel sorry when he done what he done. And he wouldn't have been sorry, ever sorry, only he was caught. That's one thing he was sorry for, he was caught. In his victim impact statement, Mary Whelan's brother, David Goff, called Whelan a coward told him he'd never, ever forgive him. Mary's only crime was loving you too much, he said. To hear David speak the way he looked at Colin Whelan in the court and said that he robbed him of their only daughter, their only sister, was very emotional for everybody. A very experienced judge of the Central Criminal Court, he used the word callous and calculating, that he hadn't seen somebody as callous as calculating as Colin Whelan in his time on the bench. Colin Whelan, who spent months planning and plotting the death of his 27-year-old bride, received a life sentence today. Colin Whelan felt he was very clever. He believed that he could have murdered his wife, disguised how she was strangled by him and walk off into the sunset with his four or five hundred thousand pounds in insurance and live happily ever after. However, it's blatantly obviously now that he's not clever, he wasn't clever. Colin Whelan made a number of mistakes. He didn't count the fact that Mary would fight against him, leaving those scratch marks. He made a number of mistakes in relation to absconding from bail. The clumsy way he left his car, the hill of Hoth. And although he researched how he could kill Mary, I don't think he realized the capabilities of a forensic team, an investigation team, that would find that Mary was strangled. He didn't realize that we would find out about the data on the computer, identifying the insurance policy, and identifying the fact that he was accessing information that he used to kill Mary and then going to an island that's visited by thousands and thousands of Irish people, that he wasn't going to be seen there was obviously stupid on his behalf as well. This was his mindset or his way of trying to fool the guards or fool the investigator, like, you know what I mean? He'd want to get up a little bit earlier now to catch me out, like, you know, really. Colin Whelan, there was many strings to his bow and the fact that he could manipulate a system to obtain a passport in someone else's name and go to Spain and take up a residency there as if nothing had happened and live a life and left what he'd done in Ireland behind. It was quite astonishing. Yeah, I think he was motivated by money. He knew that he had increased the life insurance policy if Mary Whelan had died. There was an element within him that he didn't love his wife and in fact probably had a hate for her. And I guess it was probably a hate for most women. He married Mary to murder her and claim the, the life insurance, and for no other reason. He also was a misogynist. I think he had a deep dislike for women. He was a bully. 
he had this history uh, of violence towards women. I think that he wanted to live the high life. And I think that he was a very dangerous individual because he felt that he could carry out a murder and, and walk away from it. Even though it's 20 years now since Mary's murder, it deeply wounded her community because she was so well liked. I think 20 years has sought to heal that community somewhat. However, those that can remember, it will take much longer to heal. And the fact that Colin Whelan is very shortly due to be released, I think it will uh, leave them very unnerved also. He's in just over 16 years at, at the moment. And I would guess in another two or three years, he'll be in an open prison for another three years. So I, I guess he'll be out now in about five or six years. That would be my guess. And there's nothing me or my family can do about that. He's deceitful, he's dishonest, he's violent. He has shown that he has the capacity for violence towards women, and that would worry me greatly. The family of Mary Gough have suffered and will suffer until the day they die. And should the person who perpetrated that be allowed to pass them in the street with not a care in the world? Personally, I don't think they should. I think the family should be protected from that type of ongoing pain. The whole marriage was an act. He planned everything and he acted it very well, I must say. He fooled everybody, his family and Mary's family and my own family. We, we just thought we knew him, but it was all an act. They were predators once adored by the British people, so how did they get away with it? National treasure, national disgrace. Savile, Harris and Hall is brand new Thursday night at nine on Channel 5 and My 5. Crimes that shook Britain investigates Suffolk Strangler Steve Wright next. <laughs>